30 years ago, Britain went to war with Argentina over the Falkland Islands. In April 1982, the talk was all of victory. Do you remember what Queen Victoria once said? Failure? The possibilities do not exist. And we must go out calmly, quietly, to succeed. But what's been forgotten is how close we came to defeat. If you rerun the Falklands War with the mistakes on both sides eliminated, the Argentines win. Hands down, every time you run the tape. This is the story of how we nearly lost the Falklands War. It was a shock to see one's own ship explode, burn and sink before one's eyes. It will uncover the mistakes that stacked the odds against young British servicemen. So they hadn't seen how deadly those guys could be. I can tell you, if I'd been on board that ship, I'd have swum ashore rather than stayed there. And reveal just what it took to overcome those odds. The snipers were really good. These guys will not run away. And we realized that we were in for a fight. Argentina's flag flies over what was only hours before the residence of the British governor. It's all over now. Early on the 2nd of April, 1982, Argentinian troops invaded the Falkland Islands. They overwhelmed the tiny British garrison and occupied the capital, Port Stanley. Suddenly, Britain was on the brink of war. Over a group of islands 8,000 miles away in the South Atlantic, and the British had started on the back foot. Paratrooper Mick Southall had just finished his training. He was 17 years old. Most of us, if we're honest, had never heard of the Falkland Islands. Royal Marine Dave O'Connor had recently completed a tour of duty in Northern Ireland. I'm embarrassed to say it, the Falklands wasn't on my radar. I thought it was some you know, island off the Scottish coast or something. And because it was close to April Fool's Day, people thought it was a bit of a joke. There were plenty of people who had no idea where the Falklands were, including, I understand, uh, some very senior people, both in the Ministry of Defence and the government. Ian Gardner was a captain in the Royal Marines. He led his company in the famous march or yomp across the Falklands. But in April 1982, he had just returned to his home in Scotland after a training exercise. At five o'clock in the morning, on Friday, the 2nd of April, I was asleep at home in my own bed. And the telephone rang. It was the day we were due to go on Easter leave for two weeks. So we were caught completely, uh, like everybody else, by surprise. And it's a, it's a strange feeling being called to war from one's bed. Britain was unprepared for a war in the South Atlantic, but British territory had been invaded and British citizens subjugated. The government could not let the invasion go unchallenged. It was Admiral Leach bypassed not only the Minister of Defence but also his superiors among the chiefs of staff and he went up dressed in all his uniform and looking as handsome as hell, went and embraced Margaret Thatcher and says, we've got to do it. And she said, yes, we're going to. We have to recover those islands. We have to recover them, for the people on them are British, of British stock, and they still owe allegiance to the Crown. A huge naval task force now had to be mobilised but it would take three weeks to reach the islands, and the South Atlantic winter was fast approaching. Ivor Helberg was responsible for the logistics the troops would need to land and fight in the harsh Falklands terrain. My brigade commander rang me up at good knows, knows what time of the morning, two or three o'clock in the morning, and said, go, go, go. We were really quite worried because it was obvious to me, certainly in my brigade commander, that this could be very difficult and at very short notice. And we'd never had to do this, not at such short notice and so far away. Could it be serious? 
something like 9,000 tons of ammunition actually had to be loaded. Food, of petrol, of all the stuff to do with jerry cans, all the spares that needed to go for our equipments had to be loaded on from something like 32 different depots. The British had not expected to be launching an amphibious operation 8,000 miles away. Until 1982, British eyes were fixed on battlefields much closer to home as part of the Cold War with Soviet Russia. Because of the threat from the east, Britain missed the threat of an Argentinian invasion in the west. After the war, a government inquiry judged that the Foreign Office could not have foreseen an invasion and that it was committed to supporting the islanders. But Hugo Chino, a secret service agent in Buenos Aires prior to the war, believes there were clear warning signs. Well, there had been every indication that the Argentines were rousing popular opinion in that direction. There had been uh, good intelligence from the defense attaché and from the SIS station of military preparations. There should have been no doubt that the Argentines were going to do something military. But Foreign Office policy was to sell out the islanders. They wanted to force the islanders into the arms of Argentina. Brigadier Julian Thompson commanded the first British troops to land in the Falklands. He was given a somber warning by the overall task force commander, Admiral Fieldhouse. He said to me, I have told the politicians that this will be a serious and bloody business. And you might think that I would be dismayed to hear that. Actually, I was rather glad because I'd just heard a politician on the radio referring to the Argentines as, as tin pot dictators, which they might or might not have been. But what I didn't want was my people uh, going around thinking that these guys would be a pushover. But this was not the message being presented to the British public. Margaret Thatcher was bullish about Britain's chances of success. I am not talking about failure. I am talking about my supreme confidence in the British fleet, superlative ships, and excellent equipment. Soon after she spoke, some of Britain's most modern warships would burn and sink. Many British troops would be sent to the Falklands with inadequate equipment, and men would die in unnecessary disasters. In May 1982, Britain braced itself for war with Argentina over the Falkland Islands. On May the 2nd, the country was stunned by news that the submarine HMS Conqueror had torpedoed a large Argentinian warship, the General Belgrano. Two days after the Belgrano was sunk, the Argentinians struck back, hitting HMS Sheffield, one of Britain's most modern destroyers. That was a big shocker. HMS Sheffield was our latest warship, and the Argentinians had taken her out. And here were we on a, on a huge ship packed with Marines. I was a little bit worrying. The Royal Navy was more vulnerable than the tough talk at home had suggested. The Sheffield had spotted the incoming Exocet missile far too late. The Sheffield was lost through negligence. The captain of the Sheffield had not switched his mind to war. Otherwise, he would have had all his electronics on. He'd have told the crew that they could not send messages home to their loved ones, and he would not have had the galleys frying up chips. Ian Gardner and his company of Marines were still on troop ships bound for the Falklands when the Sheffield sank. Here we were, 300 Royal Marines cooped up in the hold of what, had, what was a, a cargo ship, a, a transport ship. I don't believe I was alone in having really quite disturbing thoughts of what it must be like in a ship torpedoed or bombed at night, say, sinking. Frankly, the, 
The, whole, the thought beggars the imagination. The British now faced the single greatest gamble of the war. More than 5,000 troops in three commando brigade had to be landed on the islands. This was the one thing that I worried about more than any other thing the whole time. To minimize the risk, the British led the Argentinians to believe the attack on Stanley would come from the south. But in fact, the plan was to launch the assault 60 miles to the north from a lightly defended bay called San Carlos. But even here, the British would still be vulnerable to air attack. Carrying out amphibious operations without air superiority are a bad idea, as has been proved in the past, because they could have completely ruined the whole thing had they managed to sink the amphibious ships. The British planned to go ashore under the cover of darkness to minimize the threat. But in the wild winter seas, the risky nature of the plan became clear. This actual landing craft was used in the landings in the Falklands, and we did travel across Ajax Bay in, in boats like this. It was in semi-darkness. The weight we were carrying was very heavy. We had um, all our kit, rations, ammunition, um, and it was then old fashioned over the waist and down the scramble net into the landing craft. And it, it, it took, you know, I was quite strong in those days, young, young, strong Marine. It took all of my strength to cling onto that rope, you know, to get myself into that landing craft. And it was going up and down, you know, and that, that was a big eye opener for me for sure. The landings were badly delayed. The troops had lost the crucial cover of darkness. Instead of sailing up this, what amounted to a Scottish sea loch, not vastly dissimilar to this open area here, in darkness, not much of a problem. Sailing up this, 600 men stuffed into three small landing craft in broad daylight. It would have taken one lucky pilot or some men ashore with a machine gun and things would have gone very, very badly for us. The troops reached shore safely, but three hours later, the Argentinian air attacks began. They targeted the ships, the lifeline for the task force. How the British task force commanders have underestimated the determination of the Argentine pilots. Ship after ship in San Carlos water was hit by Argentinian aircraft. The British christened the bay Bomb Alley. This was the first time I'd seen ships sunk by enemy action in my life. I was watching Antelope and suddenly a huge explosion in front of my eyes. Large parts of her superstructure flew up into the air. I remember that explosion echoing round and, and then followed by a series of other explosions that went all night. The crew was rescued, but the ship was doomed. And the following morning, she folded like a deck chair, her back broken and sank, and both her nose and her stern could be seen above the water for some time. And eventually, the nose disappeared, and all that was left was a small life raft, as if to, to anchor, as if to, to, to mark the spot where the ship had gone down. The Argentinian air attacks were relentless. British ships and Harrier aircraft shot down more than 60 enemy planes. But many Argentinian pilots were getting through to hit their targets. The commander of the fleet recorded his frustrations in forceful language. At about 1900, yet another bloody disaster. Three A4s bombed Coventry and Broadsword, Coventry badly hit and sinking. HMS Coventry, a destroyer, was hit and has been lost. Admiral Woodward was sharply critical of some of the British ship's defences. 
no missiles fired, which is quite extraordinary and saps any faith we may have in our modern systems. For God's sake, they sent ships down there with anti-aircraft capability they knew didn't work. What we had was a thing called CCAT, which was first generation guided missile, really no use at all, unknown to be no use. On the same day that the Antelope sank, two other British ships, the Galahad and the Lancelot, were struck by massive bombs. Incredibly, they didn't detonate. Naval mine disposal expert Bernie Bruin had the perilous job of finding out why they hadn't exploded and then disposing of them. When we got on board Galahad, the first thing we had to do was to find out where the bomb was. And the only way you can do this is to find where it enters and follow the trail of destruction. It had hidden itself in amongst the debris, wrapped in a big sheet of aluminium which it had collected on the way. The one thing we could see, of course, was the nose and this uh, yellow stripe. So we knew it was a British thousand pound bomb. Argentina had acquired these bombs before the war. Now they were being used against British ships. Naval commanders had a theory about why the bombs were not detonating. We had to find out whether this fuse had been armed because the, the prognosis was that they'd been dropping these bombs too low and that they weren't being armed. And normally these fuses are activated by uh, a propeller in the tail uh, turning this little um, device here, which unscrews uh, a screw which allows the fuse to arm itself and to move and work. Normally they fall out completely, but if they're still left in, you have to find out by counting the number of screw threads just how far it has gone into the arming process. His worst fears were now confirmed. Even though the planes were flying low, the arming mechanism had done its job. What we had here, basically, was a bomb that was waiting to go bang. It just needed the slightest touch, almost. Not a, a sway or a push, but something like that. And that would have gone bang. And I had to take this out of the ship. The way I can best describe it is when you take your very young sleeping child from the back of the car at the end of a long day up to bed, you do it in a way that it doesn't know it's being moved. And that was in my mind about moving this bomb. I have to move it without it knowing that it's being moved. Bernie successfully removed the bomb from the Galahad. Naval disposal teams cradled unexploded bombs off six other ships. If these bombs had detonated on impact, the British campaign would have been stopped in its tracks. Then four days after the landings, the Argentinians struck another devastating blow. Exocet missiles hit a vital British supply ship, the Atlantic Conveyor. It was carrying four giant Chinook helicopters. Three were destroyed. It was perhaps the single greatest setback of the war. I had been preparing a plan to move my brigade forward onto the high ground overlooking Stanley, and the key part of that plan was four Chinook helicopters. In the rush to pack equipment onto the task force ships, crucial errors had been made. I think it was a great mistake to put all your eggs in one basket, particularly such expensive, important eggs as that. Certainly in my own mind, in my own journal that I kept at the time, you know, I made one or two really pithy comments about what the hell are they doing? Are they completely mad? The destruction of that one ship changed the tempo of the whole war, as far as we are concerned. We would have to walk. The plan was for three commando brigade to approach Port Stanley from the northeast, rather than the route the Argentinians were expecting from the south. But the heavily burdened troops now faced a 60-mile march through the ferocious winds of the Falklands winter. This late 20th century conflict became a medieval slog across an unforgiving landscape. Ultimately, the lack of transport 
would lead to the greatest human tragedy of the whole campaign. By May 26, 1982, against the odds, the British had a firm foothold on the Falklands. But many of the task force's heavy lift helicopters had been destroyed on the Atlantic conveyor. British soldiers had to march or yomp to battle, carrying enormous loads through the Falklands winter. Three Commando Brigade was still more than 60 miles away from Stanley. A lot of people were going, well, that, uh, you know, I don't think that's possible. Uh, do you think we can walk that far? We hadn't carried such large weights before. 120 pounds a man, perhaps 150 in some cases. So some men were carrying two thirds of their own body weight, perhaps a little more. The loads were so heavy to begin with that uh, it wasn't actually easy to get them on our backs. We've reunited Marines Ken Grassick and Dave O'Connor with the packs they had to shoulder in May 1982. must be about 30 years, I think, since uh, certainly I've seen this. Yeah, I haven't seen this. Amazing. This kit laid out like this for, you know, over 30 years. And this is almost identical to um, what the individual was carrying in the Falklands. I was a, a GPMG gunner. And I carried this, which is 24 pounds. And as a team, we were given 6,000 rounds of 7.62 link. Now, 200 rounds weighs 12 pounds. If you can imagine, um, 6,000 of these, when 200 weighs 12 pounds, and if somebody has got a calculator, they can work that out, but I know it's quite heavy. It was quite difficult with all the additional weight to actually yomp and be in an alert position. And I used to fall over all the time, and initially, you'd have to take your Bergen off, take your 84 millimeter anti-tank weapon off, put it all back on, get yourself sorted, and it took too long. So in the end, I used to just get three guys to write me, put me on my feet, and then you'd carry on. Something that everybody suffered with, whether the boots fitted them well or not, was the feet. Everybody's feet, I think, were constantly wet, and because of that, you know, an injury that hadn't happened for a long time, a uh, trench foot. Trench foot was the first stage of frostbite, and, and that would very quickly deplete our fighting strength. I thought the exposure con problem was, was really serious, so there was no way of getting them out of it. And cold injuries were the, were the thing that really worried me. The shortage of helicopter transport meant that the troops' rations didn't always reach them. Young men who'd never really been hungry beyond a healthy appetite, burning perhaps 5,000 calories in a day, no food. The hunger consumed us. We would talk endlessly about what we wanted to eat. I felt giddy, I felt jumpy, I felt irritable. It was similar to not having slept. Uh, you started not making rational decisions, you started thinking irrationally. As the march towards Stanley continued, High Command in London set a new challenge. The politicians needed some good news from the front, so precious resources would have to be diverted to capture the hamlet of Goose Green in the south. Even though the 2nd Parachute Battalion were outnumbered by the Argentinian defenders, they won a remarkable victory. But 36 men were wounded, and 16 were killed. Captain James, Lieutenant Farley, Corporal Hartman. On June the 1st, the task force was reinforced by 5 Infantry Brigade. Two of its battalions had joined the brigade just a few weeks earlier. We were on public duties. I was on a troop in the colour in 81. Uh, actually, my first duty after leaving Sandhurst was um, the royal wedding of the spring of uh, 81. But in the months immediately prior to the Falklands, we were on public duties, mainly Windsor Castle Guards. 
the troops of Five Brigade arrived in the Falklands with no real experience of Arctic or amphibious warfare. We were put on landing craft and taken to a jetty in San Carlos Bay, which is still there. Walking out the beach, I bumped into a marine colour sergeant who said to me, and I remember being rather shocked at the time, what the f are you people doing here? Um, I thought he was going to say hello or, or, or shake my hand, that actually, at least in his eyes, we weren't wanted. wanted. Looking back on it 30 years later, that was one of the frictions that made our job much, much more difficult. Five Brigade's task was made even harder because they'd been sent to the Falklands without some of the crucial equipment and supplies essential for fighting in this harsh environment. From where we sat, it looked a strange decision to send two battalions which had no experience in that sort of environment into that sort of operation. And the brigade of which they were part had very little logistics. That To begin with, they had no artillery, they had no helicopter squadron, they had no uh, engineers. It was all put together in a rather ad hoc way at the last minute. Now, Ivor Helberg learned that he would have to handle the complex logistics for the new brigade. I obviously remonstrated with Julian Thompson about this being absolutely crazy. We were stretched enough as it is looking after an enhanced brigade. But for another brigade on top of that, um, crazy. Nor was it clear what five brigades mission would be. What was wrong with their deployment, in my view, was that it was, it was a certain wooliness about what they were meant to be doing. There was talk of them being occupation troops, and, and I don't believe that they were given a firm mission. But the commander of Five Brigade, Brigadier Tony Wilson, wanted a much more active role for his troops. The new Land Forces commander, General Jeremy Moore, agreed that Five Brigade should open a second front, approaching Stanley from the south. But the new southern route was exactly what the Argentinians were expecting. Even worse, overstretched resources would have to be diverted from the Marines and Paras yomping across the northeastern route. The approach from the south was militarily insane. It was wrong by any measure. There was an established logistic route on, on the north side of the island. Their logistics were hair thin. The chronic shortage of helicopters meant that Five Brigade, including the Welsh Guards, would have to march, carrying enormous loads. Their first march did not bode well. Just before we were about to leave, the mortar platoon arrived with pallets of mortar ammunition, which were broken up and put into our backpacks. Now, my Bergen was already heavy enough for me to put two mortar bombs into it on top of link ammunition, grenades, all the rest of it, made it practically uncarryable. The march was called off after less than two miles. Some saw this failure as a sign that the Welsh Guards were not fit for operations in the Falklands. I think it's a terribly cheeky thing to say uh, and very inaccurate. Uh, and I think it, in some cases, uh, is, a, is a res, as a result of this kind of over-eliteness that we saw I I in some people uh, down there. No one's pretending we were as fit as the Marines. How could we have been? And anybody expecting that sort of thing must have been either very stupid uh, or, or mad. But the failure of the march required a new plan. The Welsh Guards would have to be carried by sea. It was the first step on the road to tragedy. On June the 8th, Two companies of the guards were on board a landing ship, the Galahad, heading for Bluff Cove. The plan was for them to land at night to avoid the risk of air attack, but they had been delayed, so they arrived in Fitzroy at daybreak. Actually, I was trying to get Galahad to move because it was a sitting duck. It was a anchor, for goodness sake. You know, Beautiful sky, as clear as it came. Absolute sitting duck. We'd seen how effective the Argentinian Air Force had been. I went and saw Galahad and uh, went on board and uh, tried to persuade the infantry of the Welsh Guards to get off the ship right away. The Galahad was lightly armed and the Welsh Guards had no defence against air attack. 
They actually hadn't seen the Argentine Air Force at work because for the five days they'd been there, the bad weather had kept the Argentine Air Force away. So they hadn't seen how deadly those guys could be. And I can tell you, if I'd been on board that ship, I'd have swum ashore rather than stayed there. Lieutenant Black was on the Galahad, preparing his platoon to disembark. My Gosman operator, so the radio operator, puts his hand on my shoulder and says, Sir, sir, it's air raid warning red. And I think I must have been on my way turning around to him and saying, it can't be air raid warning red. We were only at air raid warning whatever it was. And I thought he must have made a mistake when we heard this tremendous roar. People shout, get down, get down. I'm still standing up. I'm standing opposite my sort of best mate. The force of the blast is so strong that it blows him against the bulkhead and dislocates his shoulder. I think there was pandemonium, a nuclear screaming, uh, uh, and you could, behind me, there were men stumbling out of the doorway. Some of the casualties coming up were clearly in extreme pain. I don't think I'd ever seen people being burnt, and the smell um, and the stench of burning flesh is pretty awful. The casualty rate was 50 people died, mostly burnt, alive, and well over 100 were seriously burnt and hurt. Two weeks earlier, Bernie Bruin had successfully disposed of an unexploded bomb on the Galahad. Now he was witnessing the death of the ship he and his team had saved. There was a huge pall of smoke coming out of the uh, access hatch to the tank deck. Every now and again she shook to explosions inside, which was ammunition cooking off. And it was fairly obvious that we couldn't actually do anything for her. It was just too much for us. Um, we, we did find one young man who'd, who'd been killed there and we... Uh, covered him over. The deaths of so many men on the Galahad was a shocking reminder of the risks of fighting a war without air superiority. There was no time to stop and mourn. The Marines and Paras had to continue their gruelling yomp towards Stanley. They now faced the greatest challenge of them all, the series of fortified peaks surrounding the Falklands capital. Kent, Two Sisters, Tumbledown, Harriet, and at the centre, Mount Longdon, all of them bristling with Argentinian machine guns. Three para were tasked with taking out the position of Mount London, which was central, right in the centre of all the other positions. It looked quite big. It looked quite formidable. And it, it looked, if I'm honest again, um, I, I, it looked quite scary to me. The British did not have the artillery, the aircraft, or the overwhelming force needed to launch daylight attacks. The plan was to surprise the Argentinians at night. I remember the moon being out and I could see the silhouette of this mountain and for some strange reason, I, it reminded me of a, like a haunted castle with a silvery sky behind it. It was quite bizarre. And I remember thinking that's, my nemesis, I have to conquer that. I can remember my sergeant major turning around and saying, if you've got anyone you might want to speak to. And I thought, yeah. And I, th I know what he was talking about, he said, you might want to go and pray because some of us will not see tomorrow or will not see the sunrise. I know I did. I, I just sort of went, you know, been a bad boy. Bad Catholic, I suppose. And, um, you know, can someone look after us tonight? And as I was walking, every step I could feel, every sinew, every muscle fibre 
strike up. I could feel the sweat coming out of each pause. My body was so alive. I've never, ever experienced that before. Everything was alive, and I was just waiting for that bang. The British were tired, cold, and hungry. They now faced the most challenging battles of the war. Outnumbered and outgunned by the Argentinian defenders. On the 11th of June, 1982, British troops in the Falklands were preparing surprise night attacks on a series of heavily defended mountains around Port Stanley. I kind of remember being told to fix bayonets. And I thought, if I have to fix this thing, if I have to use this thing, OK, um, I'm going to use it. I just hope I don't have to. I really do, so, you know, bayonet, bayonet fighting is, is probably the worst part of warfare. You were right on the enemy, right face up, you know, so you, you would be bayoneting them. The Argentinians now realised that they were under attack. Rifle and machine gun fire, mortars and grenades rained down on the British troops. The noise was incredible. The screaming of people giving orders, being sort of overlaid by the screams of people who were hurt, the screams of people carrying out assaults and motivating themselves to go forward. And the noise was just tremendous. Everybody was firing. Everybody. Ian Gardner's company of Marines had reached the lower slopes of a peak called Two Sisters without a shot being fired. But the silence did not last. It was a gutter fight in the dark, close quarter fighting. Argentines were fighting from behind rocks, a case of throwing grenades over rocks, going around one man, going other men, covering them. Range of visibility, really quite short. Eventually, our section got pinned down by 2.5 machine guns uh, close to the summit and, and some riflemen. And for a while, we were actually, you know, they had actually gained the momentum and gained the initiative from us. I was basically firing at the muzzle flash of the machine gun. I would put rounds into that for as long as rounds came out of that. So I basically put rounds into that machine gun until it didn't fire back at us. We ended up at a rock and, you know, quite a large boulder. And we were sort of lined up alongside it and I was, as I look at the rock, I was to the left and, and I sort of peered round it. And I said, there's somebody out there. And the words were, shoot him then. So I sort of, I just didn't even think. And I moved around the rocks and engaged this shape and fired about five or six rounds and moved back into the rock. And then we all started moving round and we came to this figure who was on the floor. And I can remember someone saying, oh, you know, well done baby cakes, the sort of standard slap on the back, so to speak, and it, everything sort of went quiet for me. The Paras were losing men too. The Argentinians had the latest night sights, and they used them to deadly effect. It was pretty close, because um, guy, guys were going down all around you. At one stage, we were going me and a, um, another colleague were, were going up and next thing he just dropped and he'd been shot right in the eye there with a 50 caliber machine gun. No chance, he was totally, totally dead. It was at this stage that um, Court McLaughlin was given a command to actually, right, go and get our wounded, get our boys back, get up and go and get them. I moved out um, and I found or ended up at next to a young guy called Neil Gross. 
Neil was um, obviously in, in, in some discomfort. We got him onto a poncho and we carried him as best we could. There were lots of people trying to, to carry Neil, lots of people, because he was in an awful lot of discomfort. So much it was just really sad. It was actually his 18th birthday. Neil Gross died soon afterwards. Two 17-year-olds were also killed during the battle for Longdon. And 19 other paras lost their lives. Three paras should have swept over Longdon, but there was a nest of conscripts around a 50 caliber machine gun halfway along it who said, nah, you're not taking this hill just yet. And that's all it took. I mean, you can be as hard as nails and as well equipped as you like, but if you come up against people who are prepared to stand their ground, you're going to lose, man. But overall, Argentinian resistance was patchy. Some young conscripts surrendered or ran away without a fight. By June the 14th, the British had taken all the hills around Stanley. Gentlemen, I've just heard that the white flag is flying over Stanley. Very marvellous. <laughs> Courage, determination and sheer professionalism had secured a remarkable British victory. Ian Gardner's company of Royal Marines did not have a single fatality during their battle for two sisters. I think one has to be surprised at how lucky we were and how close a shave it was. There were several occasions uh, through the, throughout the war when the balance could have really gone the other way, uh, both at sea and on land. I always thought the Falklands victory on our part was, was, was a close run. The more you know about what went on and what didn't go on, the more you wonder at it. And, and I, I think that the Argentines could, could have won it had they played it right. The enormous risk in undertaking the Falklands campaign had finally paid off. But victory could so easily have been far more costly. We really had no understanding of how competent the Argentinian Air Force actually was. Um, had they actually really focused on the amphibious landing and had their intelligence been slightly better than it was, they could have done us awful harm. Today, tensions are once again high in the South Atlantic. The British government says it is committed to defending the Falkland Islanders' right to self-determination and that it has the necessary air, naval and land forces in place to protect the islands. But the man who led 3 Commando Brigade in 1982 has a sobering warning. We couldn't do it again. If the Argentines invaded the islands tomorrow, we couldn't retake them because without a carrier. And so they would be lost. It would be a huge betrayal if they were taken again because all that blood and sacrifice and all the money, I might add, that we've spent on defending them for the last 30 years would have been totally wasted. 255 British servicemen and at least 650 Argentinians died during the Falklands War. Three islanders were also killed. The British government says that no military campaign is perfect and lessons from the Falklands conflict have been learned by the armed forces. Those who survived must hope they're right. And the Revealed documentary series continues next week with the secret D-Day disaster. That's next Tuesday at 8. Stay put, because next tonight there's a new boss in Vegas and he's here to shake things up. The CSI season premiere with Ted Danson is just minutes away.